Oh, it's dark out there. Good evening, everybody. It's really cool to be here getting to share my knowledge of butterflies with you all. What's really impressive, though, is how many people showed up to learn about butterflies in the community this time. And kudos to you all, uh, in large part. And he sort of, you know, as a science teacher for 30 years, I couldn't resist a flow chart, of course. And up, up on the left, is I keep lists of things that visit our property or live on the property, and I started a butterfly list thinking it would be pretty easy. We're buried in the redwoods. We have our own redwood curtain because we live at about a thousand feet elevation up above Jacoby Creek. And I didn't think that many butterflies would make it through the curtain. Once I started paying attention, they got a little tricky. I was taking the watercolor class, as Michael mentioned, and I decided to combine both tricky things into one and do the poster. So at that point, those were the butterflies that had visited my yard. He mentioned that, um, well, a friend suggested posterizing it. And then I ran into a couple of very rare catalysts in the grocery store. Uh, and they, has anybody figured out the, the elemental symbols there? Yeah. Michael Kaufman and yeah. Alice Kaufman, right? Uh. <laughs> ran into them in the grocery store and said, hey, I did this art thing and we we're thinking about maybe posterizing it, spreading a little butterfly love. Would that be hard? And many of you know how much extra time Michael and Allison have on their hands, right? And they said, sure, that'd be easy. And they made that beautiful poster out of it, cutting and slicing it all up on Illustrator, that program. Um, then he had a hold in his schedule, and that's how you've ended up with me. Even though I'm not an entomologist, I do know how to identify butterflies because I've uh, it's kind of a rabbit hole that I fell down. And if you take a look at the poster, you can see another thing that he mentioned. Those are the butterflies that I found. You can tell there are more butterflies over here. We ran it by Peter Haggard, and he suggested some more butterflies that had not made it uphill to our redwood curtain. There were some things that live in the mountains that he said that I could leave off of the poster, but since they visit me at 1,000 feet, you know, that close to the coast, I went ahead and left most of those in there. Uh, I tried to do a really good job because it's the sciencey part of me. And there on the left are some photographs out of the books or off the internet. And those are the enlargements of this. And I started working on this presentation. And at first, I, I didn't know I was going to be using my art. And then it came out billed that way as I was going to be teaching you how to uh, identify butterflies using my art. And the science part of me just couldn't, I started getting really anxious, right? Because a butterfly that looks pretty good on a poster at 150% size, which is what they all are, when you blow them up to be a half of a meter or so big, it started giving me the creeps. And so I, I bailed on my watercolor art, and all the rest of the pictures that you're going to see are from either uh, the internet off of the NAVA website, Butterfly Association, uh, or out of one of those two books up there, which are truly impressive pieces of work. And if we had done this before the holidays, we would have made a great solstice or holiday present for someone, either one of those books. Because as much as I know about insects, which is a fair amount for an amateur person, Peter and Judy did an amazing job. Every, almost every insect that I found on our property has been in the book on the right. It's a general book about insects. It has all the butterflies in it, though, that we're going to talk about tonight. The book on the left is a very impressive work. Also, it has the advantage of being just about butterflies, so it goes into more detail about each one of them. We learn what plants the adults nectar on and which plants the larvae, how they got their crazy scientific names in Latin, and in some cases, uh, some history about them and stuff like that. It's a pretty cool book if you know somebody who is interested in butterflies. Those are the ones to get. And at the bottom, huge photo credits to the authors in NAVA again, just in case one of them is out there. Uh, before we dive into the butterfly, I'd like to separate out moths and butterflies. I was going to skip this part, but as I talked to people, I realized that I kind of needed to do it. They're in the order of Lepidoptera, second largest order of insects, right? Does anybody know, probably a bunch of you, <coughs> what, the most, uh, what the order with the most species in is? You know, the coleoptera, the beetles. So these guys fall second. They're split into butterflies and moths. Uh, moths don't get near as much 
air time or interest as butterflies do, mostly because they're nocturnal. And since they're nocturnal, they don't need color. So we miss out on a lot of that stuff. But if you look at the numbers up there at the top, they are impressive. That's like 14 times more moths than there are butterflies. So they have a huge impact on the environment and the ecology, of course. But they come out at night, so we don't pay attention to them much. There are those big differences right there between butterflies and moths. I'm, I may get to this, uh, the middle one, when we get to the evolution part near the end of the thing. But briefly, butterflies' fore and hind wings, their front and back wings, are separate from each other with moths. They're hooked together with this hook and eye sort of thing. But the big things that differentiate them are a couple of things, the club filamentous antenna. So if you've ever wondered whether something was a butterfly or a moth, and uh, if you look at it close, if it has a thin antenna, it can have a club on the end, it can be a hook, it can be colored in a variety of ways, or it can be solid. They can have really cool, when you start trying to paint them, you end up drawing these little tiny spirals, right? And then these little dabs of color on the tip. Moths, on the other hand, have a feathery antenna. That's an extreme example, of course. Uh, it's a polyphemus moth, which I hope you've had the pleasure of seeing. It does live around here. It's a big, giant, uh, lime green beast of an insect. Uh, the main thing for me that differentiates the two, though, are, is that butterflies undergo a complete metamorphosis in a chrysalis. That green thing up there on the left that you can see right there, this is a monarch chrysalis and larvae. Uh, they're pretty famous. We probably all saw pictures of those, right, in elementary school. And then more recently, of course. And moths don't have an exposed chrysalis. They cover their pupae with a cocoon and do their complete metamorphosis in there. Something I'd like to point out to you if you've never thought about it, a worm, oh, oh, oh. sorry, I'll get used to this. A worm, a caterpillar, made that shell around itself and then turned into liquid on the inside. And then a few months later, comes out as a butterfly, it just has to dry its wings for a few hours and then it can fly away. So it's pretty weird to me to imagine this little bag of fluid there turning into something with dry, papery wings. Uh, the moth on the right is the adult. So when we look at woolly bears, I realized a few years ago, I grew up with these in Missouri and then I moved to California and they are here also. And I finally realized a few years ago that I didn't know what the adult version looked like, so I looked it up, and it's this Isabella moth right there. A, a beautiful moth, but like I said about the colors and stuff like that, is, uh, it's not the kind of thing that you've noticed. But once I looked it up, I realized I had seen them around, including the, the cocoons also. So we're going to dive into butterflies now, fortunately. Um, this who was a really famous butterfly this summer. Does anybody happen to remember the name of it or what it was What it was famous for? It was in the newspapers, local papers even. It's a painted lady. Say that again? A painted lady. It is a painted lady. Excellent. And why was it famous? The numbers, the migration. Migration thing. They have this crazy population cycle and they come up out of the deserts of the southwest. The larvae eat sage and stuff like that. And every few years, seems more like somewhere between five and ten years, the population of larvae will build up into a huge number, and then they'll start this giant wave forward up through California and western Nevada. And I know I sound like a total nerd about, you know, saying this wave of, of painted ladies came forward, but I can prove it to you pretty much. <laughs> they, uh, you can go online and see people uh, down in San Diego on the beach taking video selfies of themselves with hundreds of these butterflies flying past them on the beach. Uh, a lot of them blowing out into the ocean, of course. Uh, my wife and I were in Death Valley over spring break a couple of months later, and we were miles from any blooming plants. A number of times we'd be driving down this narrow rocky canyon, and there'd be hundreds of these butterflies bouncing off of our windshield. If that still doesn't impress you, I can, I can pull this off because they actually can become a road hazard. And when you think of road hazards, when I say, you know, when a person who's into bugs says something like that, you're probably imagining that they get messy on your windows like mayflies do, right? When you drive past Clear Lake in the summer or along the Trinity River, those bugs that get smashed on your windshield, it's a little bit different than that. These populations got so high in um, 1992 that 
they had to close I-5 in Southern California, and it wasn't because of the windshield being covered with goo, it's because the crushed bodies of these things were so thick on the highway, it was causing wrecks. And they closed an interstate highway with the things. That worked for you, right? The big wave of butterfly. They came up here, uh, we saw them all over California, they worked their way up into the Pacific Northwest. We have, let's say that you're trying to learn butterflies on an alpha level, a first level. Um, then you could just see one of these butterflies and say, hey, I saw a lady out in the yard today, and that worked great. If you want to go into the beta level of this, then you need to learn how to separate the American lady on the left and the West Coast lady on the right. And to do that, you would look at those things that I've circled. The arrows are, will kind of throw you off and so we're going to ditch them there. Actually, we're not going to ditch them. Um, we're going to look at these circles that are down here on the bottom of their wings. The painted lady gets its name, honestly, by having all those extra black markings on its hind wings. So you can see it in flight. You won't necessarily need a camera, though a camera is necessary for a lot of butterfly identifications. That's one thing that I learned. Fortunately, we all carry cameras in our pockets now, right? The American lady on the left, which is a little bit smaller, has, instead of a row of dots or circles, it has a smudged area with some blue spots in it. And then on the right, the West Coast lady looks like they're very discreet black circles with the blue in the middle of all eight of the circles. And the way I remember this is that the blue reminds me of the ocean down the West Coast, right? And the painted has more markings. And the American is the least marked up of the the butterflies. A cool thing about the uh, about this pointer. A cool thing about the uh, the painted lady also is that it exists on every continent on this planet as that species, wow. not as a subspecies or anything. It's the species, and until recently, it was only one of two butterflies that were on the on in Iceland. Um, it's not in Antarctica. It's on almost every continent. There are some other butterflies that do almost as well also. The California tortoise shell, sorry about that. The California tortoise shells, these are three other butterflies that we that I lump into this group. They don't have any relationship, all of them necessarily to them, but I do this by colors in my head, so that's the way I'm going to show you all. That's the way they're grouped on your pieces of paper that you might have picked up outside. The Hidaspi fritillary, very common in the mountains. This one makes it down to the coast, commonly. So I put it up there. The California tortoise shell is in the middle, is mostly a mountain uh, butterfly, but if, and if you spend any time in the mountains, you may have seen them huddling around the lakes and ponds that are up in the mountains. They can build up in really high numbers also. Not enough to stop traffic, but they are eye-catching. And the satyr angle wing has these, has these angles on its wing is how it got its name. There are a couple of species of those. They get pretty difficult to separate out. But if you took a picture of some red butterfly with black markings on it and took it in, one advantage of photos, right, is you can blow them up with your fingers, which is amazing, and look at them closely and see which butterfly you have using your guidebook. Originally, what I was trying to do, I'd see a butterfly in the yard, and I'd run into the house to find my guidebook chanting, okay, red butterfly with black markings, red butterfly with black, black markings. <laughs> and then I'd open the book up and get completely blown away. By the time you flip to the right butterfly, you won't even know it because you've run across a bunch of other ones. So I started taking the pictures. That firmed things up for me a lot, and it will you also. And up in the mountain passes and along ridges, this is what the California tortoise shells will do some years when they're having a population boom. And they're, they're really beautiful butterflies in their own right. We're going to jump up in size a little bit. This butterfly on the left, the California sister, is not common along, along the coast, but it's so common in the mountains I couldn't leave it off. It's, it's my, uh, one of my favorite California butterflies. The Lord one's Admiral on the right is a little bit smaller. That's one way to tell them apart, but that's kind of tricky unless you have them both uh, in hand or close by. It is more common on the coast, much more common on the coast than the California sister is. And when you look at those, and you're trying to figure out how you're going to tell them apart by the time you go in and look at your poster or your guidebook, there are some things that jump out at you. That white line stripe didn't work for me at all, right? You go in going, okay, it was kind of concave, uh, one direction. 
but if you look at the orange spots, the California Sisters has a larger orange spot on there, and that's true for this species. There are some butterflies that the colors and the markings show a lot of variation between different samples of them, but these are pretty good. The main thing, however, is this black line that borders that edge right there, which is not present on the Lorquins Admiral. Once again, it'd be good to have a picture of it. Figure those two out. Um, and there's one other butterfly I lump in with these uh, because it's got the black background with the red and the white on it. It's a red admiral. It's a little bit smaller. I have W. Churchill there, not because he named it or anything, but because it helps me remember that this butterfly, its larvae, it only eats nettles. And Churchill really loved red admiral butterflies and butterflies in general, and he fought with his gardeners year after year to get them, you know how I'm going to finish this sentence, right? Get them to leave the nettles in his gardens so that he could enjoy that butterfly. So it's a memory, memory stick for me. And probably all of you, since you showed up here and you're interested in butterflies, have seen these things in your yard. They're only 25 millimeters big or an inch. You can, on an alpha level, you can say, hey, I saw a blue in my yard, which is a group of butterflies that you'll see. Uh, if you want to go beta with this business, there are four of them that are common around here. The two left ones have the orange spot. There's a whole slew of these things, but they don't generally make it down to our coast. The two on the right don't have the orange uh, band along the edge. Um, once you get it down to the Akmon blue or the lupin blue, if it's sitting on a lupin, then it's not the lupin blue, it's the Akmon blue. The lupin blue is, there was some confusion at the, when they first named this, and the man who named it got it mixed up with another butterfly, but they left it with that name, and the lupin blue, neither the larvae or the adult will have anything to do with lupins, but the Akmon blue likes them, so it's a weird thing about them. The lupin is a little bit larger by a quarter of an inch, but that's tricky, right, when you're talking about something that little and it's in your yard flying around. But it doesn't work so well. Um, to really get it down between those two, you have to dissect their genitalia, which I would call not even the beta level of butterfly identification, right? It's a much higher level of butterfly ID than that, something I'm not into. On the right, you have to look at that black band that ah, runs along <coughs> the edge of the thing. I have too big of a thumb for this pointer. Uh, the echo azure, and I just wanted to say that word, is on the right, its black band is a little less distinct. So you see what I mean about different levels of butterfly identification, right? But these are really beautiful. You tend to not notice them so much because when they land, they do this thing on the bottom so they don't get eaten by birds. Common ploy that butterflies use, and wasps for that matter. Uh, so you'll be looking at it flying and say, oh, it's really beautiful, and then it lands and it doesn't look like so much, so you walk away from it. But they're cool butterflies. And I was even afraid to show you all this slide because your eyes are going to cross because of all these uh, little, little small checkered butterflies. But they're pretty cool, and if you take a picture of them, they're actually pretty true to form. There is a lot of variation in the coppers and the crescents in general, and they're very sexually dimorphic, which means that between males and females there are differences. The purplish copper, the male is the only one that has the purple sheen on it, for instance. There are other things like that also. But I put them up there because ours stay pretty true to form. So if you take a picture of it, you'd be able to nail it with the use of the book and that checklist that we handed out. Because my problem was I didn't have a checklist. I didn't know which ones really hung out around here. So it's a, it's a gift to you all. It'll make your life a lot easier if you decide to identify butterflies. The northern checker spot is a bit larger. One of the more beautiful butterflies in, uh, when it's sitting, it has, still keeps all those great colors, and it's, it's a beauty. It's mostly in the mountains, but it does make it down to our yards. This is our last small butterfly. The rest of them you'll, you'll recognize probably for sure. This is the smallest and fastest winner, the woodland skipper. And if it lands with its wings open, it means it's probably getting ready to nectar. That's the only time I've really seen them lay out like that. There's a whole slew of them, but we, the woodland skipper, is by far the most common down here on the coast. They get their names because you, when you've, you've all seen these. When you walk through your yard, they skip in front of you from flower to flower or plant to plant. And then they fold their wings up and you don't see them again. Even worse than the blues. And they're really fast and erratic flyers. 
but they will let you, they'll get used to you, and you sneak up on them and take their picture. Um, a cool thing about them is that in the late summer, as you can see down there in the bottom box, they are often the most common butterfly in the Pacific Northwest, which says a lot for such a tiny, fragile little thing. Another interesting thing about the woodland skippers, for me, really into evolution type stuff, is that there's a big debate amongst entomologists on whether moths gave rise to skippers and butterflies separately, but they called it true butterflies. And in other words, that skipper is not considered a true butterfly. It's in all the butterfly manuals, field guides and stuff, but it's a skipper. And there's another group of entomologists who think that some skippers evolved from some moth, and then some skippers gave rise to the true butterflies, otherwise known as scudders, though I have never heard that term used. Um, but they, you know, at first I was struggling with it, but then I remembered that clouds scud through the sky, right, in literature and books that you're reading. So it sort of worked for me. So there are the flyers. For those of you who are <laughs> plant people, a really <laughs> cool thing about these is that the spread wing skippers feed on dicots and the fold wing skippers feed on monocots. I have not had time to look into that. I just learned it a couple of weeks ago. It's a, it's a weird thing, and I'm sure there's some great reasons for it evolutionarily, but I don't know them, so I can't share them with you. And now you can breathe a sigh of relief because we're on butterflies that you'll recognize. The orange sulfur is the most abundant butterfly in the high cascades in the fall, rather than just overall in the Pacific Northwest, but you see them down here on the coast, of course. The cabbage white is probably not most people's friend if you're trying to grow certain garden plants, right? The larvae love it. It's one of the only two introduced butterflies in the Pacific Northwest. I thumbed all through the guide trying to find which other one was introduced, and I didn't find which one it was. I don't know if we have it here. There's some interesting, cool evolutionary stuff with DDT use in England when they first tried to wipe it out. It had the usual <coughs> lack of success, and a lot of people now use Bacillus thuringiensis to get rid of those whites up there. And by the way, ah, by the way, I still can't work this thing. Um, these whites, there are a whole slew of pages of them. Um, but this is the cabbage white, the one you most commonly see. And it is, uh, if you put out Bacillus to get rid of these things, then you're killing all the Lepidopterans. They're all susceptible to it, of course. So before you use that, or of course any other normal pesticide, think about your butterflies a little bit and, and decide whether or not it's worth it or not. Common buckeye on the right, some people's favorite butterfly. It's got some beautiful colorations. It uh, is called a startle fake eye strategy. So it can sit with its wings folded, it'll startle up, and a bird that's trying to eat it, birds love butterflies, will possibly be scared away by that. And now we're to the swallowtail, one of my favorites, of course. A lot of people's favorites, the western tiger, and the anise and the pale tiger all come down to our coast. There are other biggest butterfly, 89 millimeters, three and a half inches. They're easy to tell apart once you, once you know how to do that. These, that part up there that I circled makes it obvious, right? That black wing bar on the anise butterfly is a distinguishing characteristic for it, and the pale tiger is not yellow. It's a pretty lame name for such a beautiful butterfly. It's always bothered me. That's the way it goes. And we have one more butterfly. Mostly stays in the mountains, but it's made it into our yard. If you go up to the mountains, you'll see the Indra swallowtail, and a little bit smaller than the pale tiger, but it's, it's got a black background, so it's easy to distinguish from those. Sometimes, if you're lucky, you'll see all of these huddling around a pond or a puddle, or even just a bare patch of earth. How many of you have seen butterflies in big clumps someplace and wondered what's going on? Okay, uh, they, can, they can do this thing. If you're, we're kayakers and we see it along the beaches a lot. Uh, an interesting thing that I didn't know until a few weeks ago was that it's when you see those butterflies huddling like that, it's virtually an entire male population of them. The males need some extra nutrients that females don't need to pass on their sperm packet to the female butterflies. So the male butterflies, if you see a clump of them someplace, they're almost certainly males. And there's some other species that do this also. But it's, it's pretty cool. They'll sit around water rivers because the water will dissolve some salts. 
out of the sand or mud. That's the same reason they sit around puddles, but they'll sit some places on bare ground, and it's usually where something is urinated, it can be an animal or a human, and boaters all are very familiar with this, people who kayak and wrap. And they're also will do that on animal scat and rotting fruit and some other things. Or, uh, they need those nutrients to reproduce. And a couple of mountain species, because so many of you do spend time in the mountains, if you go up there very much, you're going to see both of these. You can see the bottom one's called the common wood nymph, and it is really common. They're, they can be in grasslands or in uh, flowery fields. These, both of these can be present by the thousands. The Perseus dusky wing up there on top, I know some of you are looking at that thinking I misspelled Perseus. I taught way too long to do something like that. This is not named after the son of Zeus. This is named after the famous third century Roman poet that I've never heard of. But <laughs> the entomologist who named him was apparently really into him enough to do this and, and make it awkward for people doing presentations forever after. I, this is the only larva that I'm showing a picture of besides that monarch at the beginning because when we camp up in the mountains in the summer, we'll find these things crawling on our hammock ropes and things like that. That's what the word common in front of that thing means, is that they are truly a common butterfly up there. So I thought I'd throw them both in. And we're to our last two butterflies, which the monarch is North America's most famous and most easily recognized and most beloved butterfly. Now, I suppose when you see a monarch, people are going to say, hey, that's a monarch. I forgot to mention, when we looked at the tiger swallowtail, when, they, when there's a lot of those around, people call in and write newspapers and ask entomologists online what the big influx of monarchs is to do with. And tiger swallowtails are yellow, right? But I suppose it's cool that people know that monarchs, I guess in some cultures, that most people wouldn't even know that a monarch was a butterfly, right? So I take it as a positive thing that they know that there are these butterflies called monarchs out there. You can look at it the other way if you're a glass half empty person. I try not to do that. And there's, they're famous for good reason, right? Their, their colors are great. They're poisonous to birds, so birds won't eat them. I've seen videos back in entomology class in college a long time ago of birds who had not ever been around a monarch eating one and then spitting it back out. They, they hate them. Uh, and that's, of course, from the milkweed that the larvae eat while they're growing up. The morning cloak uh, is on the right, and it is an impressive butterfly. It's the same size, and you all have seen it. You may not have noticed it because it doesn't have all the bright colors on it, but they can be really common around in our forests and along the creeks and stuff. The cool things about them, three biggies, they have a huge range. You can be in Anchorage, Alaska and see one fly to Mexico City and see one that same day, and then go on to uh, Caracas or someplace in South America and see one there. Um, they have a startled sound strategy. So they don't say any noises, right? But their wings can make a clicking noise. If there's a bunch of them around a puddle and they fly up, you can hear this clicking noise, which is a pretty cool. It's supposed to scare birds. And I, it's hard to imagine, but whatever. If you're a hungry bird, it seems like you just ignore that. And they are perhaps the longest lived butterfly that we get. Most of the butterflies that I've shown you pictures of only last a few weeks, some of them a few months. The morning cloak lives as well, a little bit longer than a year a lot of times. And they don't look anything like this after a year. They get really faded and tattered. So. That's all the butterflies that are on the poster. There's a few other that are thrown in. These all are on your checklist, though. And if you take those papers home, and if you didn't get one, snag one on your way out, because it will make your butterfly identification a lot easier. And you probably already know the answer to the top question. How are butterflies doing? They're doing about as well as everything else on this planet now, uh, which is poorly, right? They have uh, the plus about butterflies is because they're so attractive, there's an unmatched data set for where certain types lived over the last few hundred years. People write poems about them, they're in literature, people drew them and painted them. Uh, the rest of the insects don't really have those privileges, right? People don't write poems about termites very often, or beetles, even as amazing as beetles and ants are, they don't show up that often in literature or in art uh, back in the old days, of course. But, um, so that's a really qualitative judgment there. 
the second light, I had trouble finding decent. <laughs> Back, let me know, because um, I'm kind of a mumbler. Um, anyway, so I'll be talking about planting gardens <coughs> and the plants that are uh, that are going to support uh, butterflies for uh, reproduction and for uh, nectar. Um, so I want to first off thanks my uh, my parents uh, Frank and Dorothy for supporting my habit when I was about ten. Uh, thanks to Scott North, uh, um, who I uh, worked with on a butterfly checklist in '94. Um, he's a mentor. Uh, Pete Haggard and, and Michael Mesler have really helped me a lot trying to learn butterflies and, and other pollinators like bees. Um, and I want to thank Gary Falza, who couldn't be here because he got a bad head cold. Otherwise, he'd be given the monarch talk after me. He and and Laurie Lawrence uh, over here, um, we worked together as a team to try to come up with uh, some common butterflies and what are the plants that are going to support them. And I want to thank, finally, for at the uh, Jefferson Community Center, I want to thank uh, Heidi Benzinelli and Mark Weller for uh, financial support to put in a, a pollinator garden or two there, uh, along as well as Steve Conlon, uh, Rianne Lopez, and Lauren Sanchez, who helped uh, build it. So back when I was a youngster, about 10, I was up there in the left-hand corner there. Maybe I'll try the pointer here, too, but that should be pretty obvious. Uh, my mother uh, made me a butterfly net out of a badminton racket and uh, some cheesecloth, anyway. Right. And they got me this big field guide. It wasn't a field guide, it was a reference book, anyway, too. So here I'm only 10 or 11 years old, and uh, it was really nice of them to support my habit at the time. And I did collect uh, butterflies. I had two collect, uh, cigar boxes that I would bicycle to the liquor store and ask them for an empty cigar box. And so my first presentation about the swallowtails. And, and it goes, uh, this certain group is, easy to, is easily distinguished by their swallowtails. They have two tails. Here's a swallowtail. That's what I wrote at the button there. Anyway, and now that you've had the ID um, test uh, by um, our prior speaker here, you can tell which one is the, which swallowtail, right? I guess I don't have to point to them. But um, they are the same ones we have up here. Anyway, except I misnamed them back then. The upper left one I call the black swallowtail, and the lower one I call the zebra. But that's close enough. The main points today for, for me is I, I want to apply a little bit about the Douglas Tallamy uh, research to, uh, with picking a plant. And then I'll talk about a plant list, and then I'll talk about a little bit about using Calscape, um, which is really handy for picking up the right plant for your yard. And I'm going to talk a little bit about applying some of this data and by building it from gardens. Um, so some of the principles for uh, the Tallamy data, and I don't know how many of you were at the, uh, the video that was played uh, maybe a year ago now. But I missed it. <coughs> but I did buy the book, and, I, and it really is interesting that, uh, to talk about how, how much insects are declining, and it's you know, mostly conversion to habitat. Um, and other things like uh, neonicotinoids, systemic uh, Pesticides are 50 times stronger than they used to be. Climate change and, and this massive invasive species all over the place is really contributing to that too. And one of the best things that came out of that is to learn that if you plant a non-native, the local insects are not necessarily going to be able to eat it. And that's uh, just like making a wasteland if you plant non-natives. So a few more things out of the Talamy data was that 90% uh, of, the, or roughly, of their uh, of birds feed their young. Lepidoptera caterpillars, like they're, they're full of calories, they've got a lot of carotene in them that helps their young grow fast, and uh, we've had a um, big die-off in bird numbers since 1970. Kind of goes along with the insect uh, die-off, too, that's been going on. Um, the, and, but like billions of birds are not around. And it was a fight to back in 1974. It's really sad. We could do a Christmas bird count, or a, like a big day, and, and well, four of us, like Lori Lawrence and Gary Fredrickson, will go out. We'll put a big effort in, but it's really hard to get the same numbers every year. There's just less species, less diversity, less numbers. Um, and also, uh, we did learn from the book that native trees and shrubs, um, the bigger, those bigger plants um, support a lot more um, lepidoptera, many of which are moths. Um, I think um, this list that we came up with too is pretty much coastal, west of um, Lord Ellis Summit, uh, and the, uh, we start to seek the common ones, and, uh, uh, and we wanted to uh, talk first about host plants with the first page. And, oh, by the way, I brought 50 copies. Maybe somebody could start passing these around. Anyway, there. But uh, we, this is also, this, our checklist is on the, uh, 
website for the North Coast chapter. So you can just download it or print it off of that if you want to. Um, so we, uh, on the second page, we have uh, nectar plants, because you, you need both, really, to attract insects and the butterflies to your, your garden. Um, so we, uh, and it's kind of hard to read here. On, uh, I didn't plan for you to be able to read it, but that's the, um, the first page of it, too. And it's, uh, it's about a dozen species of various host plants and, uh, that you can get to. Oh, that's what you get two at the same time. Um, that happened, thank you. Um, so if, if you were to really want to get a, um, a plant that has a lot of, uh, um, supports a lot of host uh, insects, you plant a willow, like, a, like a le Salix lazio lepus or something like that. Uh, here's one a willow at the Jefferson Community Center. Uh, we need a lot of native landscaping there. And it's because it supports the western tiger swallowtail, morning cloak, and Lorpens admiral. And yeah, willows aren't the neatest tree to have in your yard, but if you have like a hedge of those, you can have a lot more of this kind of butterfly. Anyway, and a lot of moths too. Um, and then if you might plant a small tree like a uh, shore pine, and they're all over the dunes, they don't get real big. Put them on the north side of your property, so they don't shade up the other part. Um, and uh, they're also host for pine elephant, and if you go up a little farther into the hills, like Lord Ellis Summit, of the uh, pine white also. Um, bust plenty of moths. Um, now we have a, a lot of anna swallowtails around here, um, and we're, we're really wanting to not use fennel. Uh, they, they like fennel, uh, they'll use it, but it's a nasty invasive and it's taken over the place. And it also supports, a, well, I'm, it's, it's kind of second hand from, from heat, but it's uh, that, that European um, paper moth, uh, paper wasps are um, abundant on it, and the more fennel you have, then those paper moths, they eat a lot of larvae, like, like monarch larvae, and so um, another reason not to use fennel or dill for that matter. So try to stick to natal natives. Uh, Carol uh, Ralph um, has been growing yampa, another uh, humble, um, and we're trying to get that uh, more available at the plant sale. So that will be a, yet another one to try beside Slomation and post Angelica for a host plant for uh, Anna Swallowtail. Um, for uh, Echo Azure, I used, to, I used to call it Spring Azure. Um, they like Ceanothus. So how big is your yard? If you've got a um, big yard, get, get the species. It'll go 20 or 30 feet tall. Um, if you have a, a maybe not so much room, you could put in a, a Ray Hartman size blue blossom. Or a smaller yet is a Julia Phelps. A smaller dark star. And what I put in at the Jefferson Community Center is, a, is one called Skyrock, which is supposed to be only about three, four feet by four feet or so. So it kind of depends on the size you have. The bigger, the better. Um, and now think about nettles and thistles, too. So uh, yeah, they hurt when you wag your hand against them. But if you're going to handle them, just put gloves on them. Anyway, so we, uh, the cobweb thistle is, uh, um, the thistles are good for both painted ladies and uh, my leader crescents. Um, and the stinging nettle, which you know, a lot of people are loath to put it in their yard, but if you could find a place to contain it, like I've got, got a community center in a corner anyway, because um, it does, go, has, does have stolen, it's middle one of creek, but um, it's really good for those red animals that uh, the Winston Churchill seemed to like. Um, now, a plant that uh, has, has been very popular at the Jefferson Community Center is the uh, that's the Dalsia mellifera. It's been very popular, or it's a host plant uh, for a painted lady. Um, and this, uh, I believe, is a uh, West Coast leaf caterpillar. I'm, I'm not real good on caterpillars, but uh, yeah, this was um, at the Lost Foods uh, Nursery, and, uh, and uh, Monty Cade uh, showed this, this to me. So you need to have host plants, but you need nectar plants, too. Uh, now, Akamon Blue, um, possibly Lupin Blue, uh, anyway, it's a uh, and uh, they like buckwheat in the dunes. Um, and so I have a uh, uh, post um, buckwheat in the garden that I'm planting. And uh, they also like other pea family, uh, like lupins uh, as well. So that's a coastal one. Um, now for nectar, for um, Sedelsia again, um, it's been very popular with the <coughs> other butterflies like the uh, orange sulfur. But lots of bees seem to like it too. So I've had sweat bees. and and uh, leaf cutter bees, and uh, this bumblebee, Bombus mixed is uh, uh, using it too. 
Um, I did plant a few non-natives, um, mostly for nectar. Um, if you want, we're going to do host plants, skip the non-natives. But uh, I found that Cosmos, this sensation variety, is uh, uh, really attracted a lot of bees and a lot of butterflies. So I did uh, tend to uh, get a couple six packs of those. Uh, and they, uh, they keep receiving themselves. They're still blooming now in January. Um, so then uh, by the midsummer, um, more of the Asteraceae uh, start blooming. And you start getting like uh, a Ridgeron uh, Glaucus. Um, and these, now I'm talking about nectar plants, really. Um, and yara, called yarrow. Um, and so, but it's nice to have nectar plants going all through the spring, the summer, and the fall. So you have to think about when uh, your plants uh, um, go into nectar. And here's a, a fiery skipper on Seaside Daisy. Skippers, as, as we know, they like monocots, so they like grasses. So I put in a red fescue at, at, in, uh, at Jefferson, and then in my next garden I put in a uh, California fescue. So they might have something that they can uh, lay eggs on there too. But for nectar, you know, just have a variety of other choices for them. Some things are fall, like the gold rod, a good nectar plant in the fall and the spring. Bolander's Facelia or Facelia uh, Californica are good to have for spring bloomers. Um, then uh, California Poppy, um, you know, just a, one little seed packet can go a long way for, um, and I like the coastal form. This is more the Caltrans uh, bright orange color there. And there's a yellow-faced uh, bumblebee or something just like it uh, there. And then uh, I like Palladiums, um, another one of the Asteraceae that likes uh, more of a midsummer um, nectar plant um, with a sweat bee on it. Um, so some of the uh, sources we use were Calscape. I'll talk a little about that next. Um, the Xerces Society is the biggest conservation organization for um, for insects. Um, and so NABA, uh, I didn't, we didn't say what NABA is. Uh, it's not the uh, National Association of Black Accountants, and it's not. It's, and there's another NABA. It's the uh, the uh, National uh, Adult Baseball Association. Now, that might be a fine group, um, but it's the National uh, or North American Bird uh, or Butterfly Association. Their planting guides are useful, but they do have a lot of non-natives in there. So I tend to just pick the native ones um, on their planting guides. Um, we did look at the field guides that uh, Robert talked about, too. Um, but uh, I'll go to Calscape uh, uh, next. Uh, it has a lot of information about not only native plants, and the, including the varieties and cultivars, but it has different, like their sizes and stuff like that. It's kind of handy when you're planting a garden. Um, so uh, I'll show you how it's clickable. If you were to look up at uh, this, there's a button up here. It says butterflies. Because um, right now you can pick on uh, perennials or shrubs and trees and get a, get a lot of information about it. But let's say we clicked on uh, butterflies. You get to this page that uh, shows, um, I know it's hard to read, um, but it might have Painted Lady or uh, Tom's Buckeye and his Swallowtail. Let's say, let's say we took uh, Western Tiger Swallowtail and we clicked on that button, and then you'd uh, get a nice picture of it. You get the, you get the range maps, and then below that, um, you get some uh, choices of uh, confirmed, uh, these are confirmed uh, host plants. So you could look at what they are, and I know it's hard to read, but there's um, oh, California sycamore, white alder, holly leaf cherry, quaking aspen. These aren't really in our area. Okay. So then you get to arroyo willow, uh, salix, uh, lazulepis. Well, that goes around here, so that might help you decide uh, which natives. And then if you click on uh, arroyo willow, it'll tell you how many different uh, lepidoptera uh, it supports, which could be um, hundreds. Uh, really, uh, so that's how we used, uh, um, and that's how I used Calscape. Now, this is a little segue here to uh, a year ago, this is January, um, I've been eyeing this little 10 by 15 spot of soil that it has to be weeded every two, okay, two months or so. And I go, ooh, I want to do a pollinator garden. And so I got the, uh, got the go ahead with, uh, from Heidi and Benzinelli and, and Mark Weller to, to go ahead and buy some plants. And um, then I had to think about well, what would you plant? I mean, then, and so, uh, oh, 10 by 15? That's the size of Henry David Thoreau's cabin. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a replica of it. Um, it has nothing to do with butterflies. <laughs> um, so, for my pollinator gardening tips are that you search out um, the spacing ahead of time. 
so you, you start with maybe a bigger plant so you don't get it too crowded. Uh, select a variety of plants so that it blooms every month of the year. And, and uh, plan on weeding uh, at least every couple weeks because I'm really lazy about that personally. So it gets kind of overgrown. Um, and in the first summer, I do plan on watering. I water um, about 25 gallons every uh, like Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Just with a five gallon bucket. That's how I know the gallons because I have to carry five gallon buckets to the garden until we've got into the water source. Um, and also, we want to keep some bare soil areas for these. Uh, Big tunnels because I did at least in, found one tunnel um, while uh, um, this plant garden was going in the summer. And then uh, the water source that, that Robert talked about, they do attract wildlife, not only, and also birds um, too. And, uh, and having a little muddy area that's in a sunny location will allow the uh, butterflies to be able to get some of those minerals out of the mud. So, um, this is, now I know it's hard to read this sketch, but this is my the sketch I did of that 10 by 15 spot. And so I did, uh, I did it in pencil, because you're going to keep changing all the time. So uh, here's a, a manzanita here, about four feet across. Here's a ceanothus, about four feet across. This was a gum plant that's going to be about three to four feet across. Here's a salvia, uh, a sage, anyway. Here, we, and then here's a, a lupin, which can get kind of big. And so I started with the big plants, and then maybe try to get a walkway. Where would you put some stones to walk through the garden? And so that's kind of the things you do in January when it's raining outside.